Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on the Energy Anywhere Cooking for Life Africa. My name is Bruno and I will be your host for this session. I'm with Anova, the market leading IoT solutions provider and digital partner, as well as industry council member of the World Liquid Gas Association. We are thrilled to have you with us and I'm personally honored to be your host today. We hope you find today's presentation informative and engaging. Before we dive in, let me give you a brief overview of what we will be covering today. In this webinar, we will discuss the objective of the International Energy Agency Summit on Clean Cooking in Africa, its outcomes and the implications for the LPG industry in Africa. The International Energy Agency convened a summit on clean cooking in Africa with the goal of accelerating progress towards ensuring clean cooking access for all Africans. Currently, nearly four out of five Africans still cook their meal over open fires and traditional stoves using wood, charcoal, and other polluting fuels. This practice has severe impact on health, gender equality, and environment. By focusing on clean cooking solutions, policy frameworks, and investment strategy, the summit aims to drive positive change and improve the life of millions of people across the continent. For this discussion, we are honored to have with us Pam Indurji, Managing Director from Oryx Gas in South Africa, Global Chair of the Women in the LPG, and Chair of the LP Gas Association of South Africa. Elizabeth Muchiri, LPG Business Consultant and East African Director of the Global LPG Partnership. Monzur Siddiqui, Head of Business Development at the LPG Business Line at Total Energy. Monzur brings more than 20 years experience within the liquid gas industry across the globe. James Bullen, head of downstream at Petrodeck. James is an experienced business leader with a demonstrated history of creating new opportunities in the energy sector. And finally, Michael Kelly, Chief Advocacy Officer of the World Liquid Gas Association that will give the kickoff for this exciting, important webinar. But before that, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Today's webinar will last approximately one hour. We will have Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to submit your questions at any time using the Q&A box or raise your hand during the webinar. Now, Without further ado, let's get started. Michael, the floor is yours. Bruno, and thank you for that nice introduction. Remember everyone, uh, we do wanna keep this as interactive as possible. So feel free to join in the fun by submitting your questions. If we don't get to them now, we promise to get to them in the future. Um, I have to say an antitrust statement because this is a World Liquid Gas Association meeting. So we will not talk about prices or volumes or anything that's going to make our uh, lawyers nervous. Let's stay on the straight and narrow and keep this uh, keep this party clean. Um, as Bruno mentioned, we're having this meeting in the context of the International Energy Agency holding the Summit for Clean Cooking in Africa on the 14th of May, which was by a long way the single largest gathering um, focused on clean cooking ever. Um, and uh, we have to give credit to the IA for raising this issue very high up on uh, the public imagination and on the global agenda. And we're going to see the issue of clean cooking reflected in international and multilateral events going forward, such as the G20, which is coming up in, in Brazil, and then uh, in the various United Nations negotiations on climate change, such as COP29, which will take place in Baku in Azerbaijan in November. And LPG was discussed at a very high level in a very positive way. So this presents an incredible opportunity for our industry. And it is an amount of recognition that our industry simply isn't used to getting. And one of the things we wanna discuss here today is 
what we as an industry should be doing to take advantage of this and where we as an industry can provide guidance uh, to um, different types of organizations that are trying to funnel investments into markets in Africa that need access uh, to LPG. Just a reminder, we are the World Liquid Gas Association, the global voice of the LPG industry. If you're not a member, you should be, because there are only two types of LPG in, uh, companies in the world, WLGA members and future WLGA members. So if you're interested in joining, please let myself or one of our colleagues know following this webinar. Uh, we're going to move forward, and I'm going to ask each of the speakers to start with an opening statement. And the issue is, uh, what are the prospects for clean cooking in Africa? And then after that, we'll move into a pure Q&A discussion. And again, we hope to get uh, questions from those of you who are attending the webinar. So I'll start with Elizabeth, um, who's an LPG consultant in Kenya. Elizabeth Gutierrez, I've known you for many years, and you have a wealth of experience. Kenya is one of those pivotal markets in sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, one of the pillars we think that is is going to have to grow first um, to maybe kick off some growth in, in East Africa. So Elizabeth, what are your thoughts on, on the issue of, what are the prospects for clean cooking in Africa? Uh, thank you, Michael, and thank you to all the LPGA for inviting us in this to, to discuss uh, LPG and clean cooking in sub-Saharan Africa. We are also grateful for, to EAA for raising the flag of uh, LPG because for a long time, <clears throat> uh, clean cooking was about improved cook stoves. And now we see that uh, we are actually talking about real clean cooking with LPG. And as you say, yes, Kenya is uh, doing reasonably well. But uh, as we all know, we are very far from where we ought to be. And as leading the, the rest of East African countries, um, the, or the whole of East African countries are all uh, looking at LPG, and we see the president talking about clean cooking with LPG in Kenya, in Uganda, in Rwanda, in Tanzania. The president of Tanzania was uh, discussing this at the EIA. And the rest of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, there's, uh, it, there has been very, very low usage, about two kilograms per person per year, and now we are moving up. And uh, I would say it's a great opportunity for all the companies, for all the individuals, for World LPGA and um, the us in the LPG sector to help uh, the advise the markets, the government, and the private sector players to on how to increase the uh, usage of LPG. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was a, really, a good statement. Can you maybe can I maybe ask you uh, what lessons do you think the Kenyan experience can provide uh, as Kenya is is relatively advanced? or other Sub-Saharan African nations. So what uh, challenges has Kenya faced that maybe could provide lessons for some of the other uh, countries? I would say for the last uh, two decades, Kenya, the government has made various steps on how to increase uh, LPG usage. And uh, we have made very good progress. Uh, sometimes we have made uh, mistakes along the way, which we learn from and uh, come back. Uh, for instance, uh, we, started, we started by standardizing the cylinder sizes and the verbs and then creating a set exchange which uh, grew the market quickly, but then also created uh, problems and the market stagnated. Then uh, after about 10 years, we changed the regulations and uh, dismantled the exchange, uh, but it's not quite gone. So the market has grown again and stagnated. It's been a very interesting journey. I think uh, Kenya would provide very, very good lessons for those who are still trying to increase uh, LPG usage on what to do and what to avoid to do. Yeah. Yeah, because it's important to learn what to do, but it's also important to learn what not to do. Let's turn our attention to South Africa, to Pam Indujith, uh, the Managing Director of Oryx Gas in South Africa, and also the chair, the current chair of Women in LPG, which is the global uh, network created by the World Liquid Gas Association to try and get more women into the LPG industry. Pam, let's have your opening statement. Sure, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's actually quite interesting. We're coming together on a vital subject matter a day before we go to the polls. So mm -hmm. it's elections tomorrow in, in South Africa. So, so thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you to the organizers who have initiated this, this uh, webinar. Indeed, an important topic. And why do I say important is because it remains a very serious topic. 
Um, and as we know, I'm going to repeat a few points that were said at the outset. There's billions of people that are still not cooking uh, food safely. There's billions of people that have limited access to clean cooking solutions. There's many out there that are subjected to health risk, as we know. Are we transitioning from a high emission source? Indeed, not fast enough. And if I have to bring it home, absolutely not fast enough. So here's some of the LPG mantras that we're all familiar with, and it goes like this. LPG has been identified as the most appropriate, efficient, and effective fuel for all households. LPG is cleaner, an uh, uh, energy source for healthier people. LPG is a critical part of the energy landscape, and this is confirmed and embraced by local government. So households, as we know, consumers, particularly disadvantaged rural and marginalized communities do not have adequate access to affordable, safe, and cleaner energy sources for cooking and space eating. It's a definite challenge locally. So health and safety is critical for development and sustainability across Africa, LPG. And indeed there is, and we're finding this daily, there is a general lack of public education and awareness. But I'm glad we're doing something about this uh, locally, uh, especially with our industry associations, LPGSA, SAPIA, the South African Petroleum Industry Association, has been engaging with government and key stakeholders. Government's commitment to prioritize the positioning of LPG specifically for households, making appliances a lot more accessible and affordable. This is a topic that that is still pending some outcomes, but we're there. Public and private partnership is encouraging with some attention that we are seeing already within the local industry. You heard me speak about LPGSA. They have been embarked on a significant and robust LPG campaign, and it's to raise awareness and an education campaign. So really getting our communities to understand that it's safe that you can cook on LPG. So we're taking some baby steps. We're not where we need to be, but I'm glad we're having these conversations. A shout out to the WLGA that supports these local associations for their intervention, support, exposure, best practice sharing across the globe is always welcomed. So continue to do that. Some other points very quickly, development through some of these initiatives that I just spoke about, and more importantly, the intention to also create direct and indirect employment opportunities is also encouraging. And that's through the significant investment, which I'll touch on later. The LPG industry is already on its way, and you heard um, the, the uh, reference to Global Share. And when we say on its way to transformation, there's some tangible examples, and this hap is happening across Africa and the globe. So we're truly walking the talk on some meaningful actions. Can we do more? Yes. But what do I mean when we say walking the talk? Do you recall in the past, drivers, fillers, depot managers, it was always deemed as a male-dominated industry. So some appointments are now being filled by females, which is really enlightening to see. But bringing it back to this webinar, uh, there was reference to gender equality, an intriguing global story, and I want to share this. It comes from a previous summit uh, when the India team came across to South Africa. And it said something along the lines of subsidies should go to who needs it. Subsidies should go to women empower women of the household. And how did they do this? It was quite an eye opener in terms of how they allocated subsidies. Women were spending seven to eight hours to source wood to make just basic food. And through these subsidies and converting them to use LPG, 
they now spend two hours a day versus that seven to eight hours. And they have more time with family and educating their kids. That was indeed a lovely story and something we want to take with us locally and adapt. So Africa does have a lot to do. How do we accelerate the voice of LPG and remove any form of negative perception? We still have a way to go with that locally, but there's some actions as I, as I mentioned, uh, but indeed massive potential. And that's what we wanna tap into. So my very last comment uh, to, to Michael, the team and those that are listening, we have definitely started this journey. Uh, we agree we definitely need to do more. We need to pick up the pace to follow and adapt the global momentum where there's notable progress. So you continue to run along the global team. We're right behind you, copying and pasting. <laughs> Thank you. Back to you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. And uh, and if you want to see how well they're copying and pasting, make sure you join us no the week of November 18th in the magical city of Cape Town, where we'll be holding LPG Week this year. And you'll see a little video about that uh, at the end of this webinar. Uh, we're going to turn yeah. to Monzur Sediki from Total Gas. Uh, Monzur, before I ask you to give your statement, your CEO, Patrick Poyonet, gave a very full-throated announcement during the IEA summit on the 14th of May. Do you want to enlighten us a bit as to what he said? Yeah, yeah sure. Thanks, uh, thanks, Michael, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. And during the IEA conference, he clearly mentioned uh, the commitment of Total Energies and uh, would like to achieve uh, 100 uh, million people. We would like to reach 100 million people in the, in the coming years. And uh, Total uh, Energies is going to invest uh, more than 400 millions of dollars uh, to, to achieve this project. project. So it's a, it's a significant, uh, 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 I think, uh, uh, announcement uh, which is uh, pushing us towards achieving that because we are present in Africa for quite a long time. So uh, today I believe that uh, it, it's an appropriate time to discuss and to shed light on a critical issue like plain cooking uh, in Africa. So I, I'd like to you know, uh, go back to, to, to the, the professor, the, what you, you are requesting uh, us to say. So directly to that. Okay, so while the challenge is immense, uh, there exists a solution that is both scalable and available today. That solution is liquefied petroleum gas. The urgency of clean cooking, of course, uh, we, we know and we acknowledge that over 900 millions of Africans still rely on biomass fuels and kerosene for cooking and these traditional fuels contribute to uh, lots of indoor air pollution, deforestation and health risk. The need for cleaner alternative is undeniable. Why LPG? I'm not going to talk many things about the benefits of LPG, but just three points in, in my opinion. The first one is all the good advantages of LPG, like efficiency, emissions, and transportability. We are aware that uh, the, all the benefits about LPG, LPG burns more efficiently than wood, charcoal, and kerosene. It produces fewer uh, carbon emissions and particles and making it a cleaner choice uh, for cooking. And the most important part is the easy transportability of LPG is an important aspect pertinent to Africa, particularly where there are many challenges to gain access to other cleaner options. The second one, I would say the global recognition. The International Energy Agency and the World Bank have unequivocally endorsed LPG as a crucial component of clean cooking. Their vision extends beyond 2030, emphasizing LPG's role in reducing household air pollution, mitigating deforestation, and improving women's well-being. And the third one, which is very important, is the political opportunity, I would say. On May 14, 2024, the IEA convened world leaders at a global summit on clean cooking in Africa, which you have mentioned. The gathering aimed to catalyze major commitments toward African clean cooking. Heads of states, 
Ministers, CEOs, and NGOs were present discussing clean cooking challenges and LPG's pivotal role on, on clean cooking. We also know that, uh, as you said, that upcoming events like COP and G20 uh, further address this critical topic. So I think that we should get this opportunity. Now, uh, you, you just mentioned that what could be our role you know, to, to gain, uh, maximize from this momentum. I, I think this LPG marketers, organizations, decision makers, and networks can contribute to supporting LPG sector development by taking an appropriate action plan to address the current impediments to ensure LPG growth and making it an affordable and scalable solution for the mass of Africa. Let's align uh, self-interest with the public interest and accelerate the transition towards clean cooking. Here, I, I'd like to give the uh, example of some um, you know, countries who have achieved uh, a highest uh, growth in clean cooking. Uh, a lot of time we give the example of India. Uh, you know, India is one of the largest LPG consumer in terms of residential cooking. In each second, around 80 cylinders are delivered in Indian households. So in my opinion, because, you know, I, I work there also, but in my opinion, I think there are main three pillars. The first one is the appropriate and enforced LPG regulation. The, the, the government regulators, uh, the regulation plays a pivotal role in ensuring the safe and efficient use of LPG. Strict uh, enforcement ensures also the adherence to safety standards, proper handling and uh, prevention uh, to misuse. Uh, regulatory bodies also oversee the, uh, the aspects like cylinder inspections, licensing of distributors and safety protocols, etc. The second part is the affordability affordability supported by the government. As Pam, Pam said just a few moments back, the government's commitment to affordability is crucial and channelize it to the right people. The subsidies or the direct benefit transfers of uh, directly uh, going to the beneficiaries who are using it and uh, it makes uh, LPG accessible uh, to all. And then slowly when they are used to it, with economic development, gradual removal of subsidies while controlling wastage ensures sustainability. So both public and private sector collaborate to maintain uh, the affordability. And, and, and the third one is the sustainable distribution model. Dedicated distributors ensure efficient supply chains, uh, multiple points of sales and home delivery enhance convenience for consumers. Uh, here, I just would like to mention that the distributors are a very strong partner in our ambition. If they are not there, who will give the last mile delivery? So we need to uh, you know, build this capacity so that they are working together with us to reach the, uh, you know, each household, the, the maximize the penetration. And the private sector initiatives drive innovation in distribution, logistics, and, and customer use. So ensuring clean cooking object, uh, objectives, I believe that just three things, a sustainable environment is essential for investors' confidence. Safety measures like cylinder integrity and uh, household penetration must be prioritized. Affordable price encouraging adoption and supports cleaner cooking practices. So in, con in conclusion, what I'd like to say that uh, like many other uh, you know, countries which demonst demonstrates the power of coordinated efforts uh, uh, you know, across regulation, affordability and distribution. And we can learn from this experience and, and the important elements can be taken and implemented in Africa for a healthier uh, and greener future. So LPG is not just a fossil fuel, it's Africa's best option for cleaner, uh, uh, greener and um, you know, uh, the, the best option for them um, to, to, to go forwards uh, for clean cooking. And let's seize the opportunity, empower communities and create a healthier and more sustainable future. That's all. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mansoor. That's, that's uh, really interesting. Can, can I just ask how many countries is Total currently distributing LPG in, in Africa? Uh, in, within Africa, we have more than 22 countries currently we are operating. 22 countries. Yeah. And, and with the new, the commi new commitment is are you going to expand the number of countries? Or are you going to grow the businesses in those countries? 
Uh, there are two here. aspects. One is uh, grow in the existing countries, uh, do more penetration. But at the same time, we will be going in new countries where we do not uh, run LPG, but we will uh, open up the LPG, uh, you know, uh, uh, businesses there so that we can yes. extend it. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so you well, you heard it here. There's going to be an expansion of Total around the African continent. Thank you, Manzur. Thank you for that opening statement. Let's turn our attention, last but not least, to James Bowen from uh, Petrodeck. And James, you were there on the 14th of May at the IEA summit. So maybe why don't you preface your opening statement with telling us a little bit about what you saw, uh, what your thoughts were, and most importantly, what you think the result is going to be. What comes next? Thanks, Michael. Uh, afternoon and afternoon to everyone else. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, it, it was, It was as you said yourself at the start of this call, this was unprecedented. Nobody had attempted anything on this scale before. It was very interesting to see it all come together so quickly. And I think for that alone, the IEA should be should be lauded for their the work they did. Um, it was uh, a massive task to pull that off and um, bringing everyone together, including a number of, of significant uh, international uh, heads of state, global leaders, um, significant um, spokespeople from around the world, and of course, uh, a high African participation level as well. So in that regard, they did really well. I think because of the scale of it, because of the time frame of putting it together, there's always going to be gaps. There will be elements of it that you look at on the agenda in advance and say, I'm not quite sure how that really fits or why that would be on the agenda. And there'll always be some opaque areas as well. And I think you know, some of us that when you and I included in that discussion after the event, we did sort of have a bit of a post event discussion about what we what we felt were the highlights and what we felt could have been done differently. I think the main the main point to say is LPG came out of the uh, of the summit in a really favorable position uh, in the clean cooking context. It was left, um, it, it was not ambiguous at all to say that LPG was left as really the only Pan-African viable solution for tackling what is an infinitely solvable problem. This is not difficult. This is not like we need new technologies or new methods to get the product out there, new distribution systems. And overall, it also doesn't require vast amounts of money in the context of solving other problems uh, that, that you might compare to this. So, so I think the good news is we're talking about something that already exists, is well understood, has um, a good uptake already, a good presence across Africa. We aren't starting from zero. Um, and, and in that sense, it was really obvious from, from hearing some of the people uh, that, that did take the podium as either co-chairs or lead speakers. It, it was great to hear them champion LPG for exactly what it is, which is a relevant, viable and fast solution to this problem. I think the, the, the outcomes we, we can't measure yet. We can't say how good is this as a platform for pushing LPG uh, as a clean, clean cooking solution. We don't know. Certainly, there were a lot of uh, claims, promises, pledges made by participants at the event. The IEA has promised to ensure that those are made good upon um, by following up and monitoring and reporting on what's been done. Um, but the truth is, Michael, we don't know yet. It's, it, it's, it's so fresh. We don't know what the outcomes, tangible or otherwise, will be. But I think what it has done is provided the basis for roadmaps to be written and directions to be created to, to really tackle this problem. Uh, and in that respect, I mean, the association's own creation of a task force specifically to take on this problem is, for me, an even bigger takeaway than some of the, the, other, the other outcomes, shall we say, of, of the summit. The fact that, that we as an industry are creating a task, task force specifically focus on LPG is a really good thing. Yeah, because don't let's forget, there were other competing energy alternatives at the event, um, some of them feasible, some of them very far from feasible. 
Um, and there were signs in advance that LPG could have easily got lost in a, in the climate change discussion, which it did. not yeah. um, So I think overall, we came out in a pretty good place. Yep, absolutely. I have to agree with you there. And what James was mentioning was the creation of the Cooking for Life Africa Task Force, which the World Liquid Gas Association has created post um, IEA, or actually pre IEA, as a platform for our industry to participate in the IEA uh, event. And uh, Total is a member, and so is Petrodeck. James, let me follow up with something because um, Petrodeck has made some key investments in some Saharan Africa. I'm thinking specifically about the terminal in Richards Bay, which is bringing a lot of product into, into sure. South Africa. Um, and you've said in the past that you see infrastructure as a key growth enabler. Can you explain what do you mean like that? And then maybe I'll get the feeling of um, the other panelists. But a focus on infrastructure is something that came up at, on the 14th of May, and it's something that Petrodeck in particular has pushed a lot. Can you explain that to us? Yes. Um, we've Wherever we look around Africa, you can, you can typically find LPG in, in some form of evolved presence. Uh, it's, it's certainly been around the continent for a long time, 50, 60, 70 years more in some cases. So it, it, it's not fair to say that it doesn't have a footprint. Um, historically, LPG has been something of a poor relation in the petroleum products sector. Um, and that typically came from the fact that it evolved as a byproduct of refining and processing and was often an inconvenience in comparison to, let's say, marketing the other more widely used products. So there wasn't historically a great deal of investment made in large scale distribution systems and uh, supply chain optimization. In spite of that, LPG actually did pretty well, particularly in some regions. Um, and that's, that's really, uh, that always comes down to the same thing, which is that actually it's a really good fit as a fuel option, as an energy source for Africa. So one way or another, it, it gained traction. If you roll forward to, to the, 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 the present day, there's a real mix across Africa of, of where LPG is in terms of how far it's, it's developed and how, how, how widely it's distributed. And we, uh, we noticed some time ago that those markets that had invested very early on um, in large scale infrastructure, sophisticated uh, distribution uh, and logistics systems, had really been able to spread uh, the use and availability of LPG much wider, much faster. A, a classic example in the African context would be Morocco, uh, which took the mantle very early, uh, very early on and was able to, to, to really establish LPG as, as a very viable energy option. Um, other countries, not so much, but what, what we noticed was perhaps the, the way to capitalize on this known presence was to, to tackle that lack of infrastructure, to make an investment in something that, that we always say has to deliver, much like Mansour's uh, three pillars for market development. We, we have three pillars uh, for investing in, in LPG infrastructure, but they're very closely correlated. Uh, and they're always um, being able to make sure that, that the product that you might bring in through these larger scale facilities is economically viable, i.e. cheaper than uh, alternatives in, in, in smaller systems, always available and in the location where it's needed most. Uh, and if you can if you can marry those three things, you can you can typically have a chance at success. So we've always taken the view that we like to build for the future. We like to look at systems that will be in place for decades to come, not just solving a problem that exists now, which itself is typically a legacy problem, as I say anyway. Um, so yeah, that, that's been our view and our strategy and continues to be. Um, South Africa is a great case in point. You raised you raise, uh, Richards Bay, which has been a development in partnership with, uh, with Bidvest tank terminals down there. LPG has been in South Africa a long time. It's had relative successes. Um, but it's never been able to, from an import perspective, be economically viable because there just hasn't been enough scale of, uh, to it to, to make sense. That has changed with, with not only our investment, but others as well. 
Um, and that's something that we 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 hope across the continent to see more of, not just from our own perspective, but across the continent in terms of growing LPG. Uh, and that's Great. yeah, that that that's always been the philosophy. Thank you, thank you, Pam. I saw you nodding there. Is there anything you want to add? Because he's talking about your home market. Yeah, well, well spotted. Uh, that uh, commissioning of the Richards Bay facility couldn't have come at a better time. There was this domino effect of our local refineries going down during uh, COVID. We had government, um, you know, put some pressure on the industry to double the LPG demand over the next five years. And you can only do that when you have security of supply. So government came around the table with industry, looked at how do we incentivize and encourage more imports, coupled with the commissioning of this facility. And what do we have? A situation of imports unlocked, security of supply, but the parallel discussion has to be infrastructure development. And that's what James alluded to. So yeah, South Africa's on its way in terms of encouraging further imports, but around the country, we do need to have parallel investment uh, conversations, commitments, uh, looking out for at least a five to 10 year pipeline as we continue to double this LPG demand. Uh, yep, excellent point. And uh, let's build on this, Elizabeth, and, and, and ask a little bit about Kenya. Because I know the Port of Mombasa for years had been a infrastructure bottleneck for product coming into Kenya. Is that being addressed or has it been addressed? And do you foresee uh, this kind of infrastructure being put in place to unlock the potential in the Kenyan market? Uh, thank you, Michael. So uh, the port of Mobasa has been partly ad addressed from uh, say 2011 when uh, a private facility was uh, put up with a government concession. And that uh, infrastructure helped the prices to come down drastically. It also contributed a big deal to the increase in consumption for the first uh, 10 years of, after the infrastructure was put in place. Uh, there has been calls for several other infrastructures to, to provide competition because uh, the existing one is a privately owned. And uh, it is quite clear that we could get uh, lower prices if we had a uh, uh, lower uh, increased competition at uh, Mobasa. Uh, we there are talks of the government putting up uh, an extra infrastructure in Mobasa. This debate has been going on for the last ten years, and there are several other people who have expressed interest in uh, expanding, uh, putting up their own uh, infrastructure. So we are hoping that soon, we, sooner than later, we are going to have a second one or a third one. Uh, of adequate size to handle a big ship, not the, because we already had a smaller one that was handling on the, uh, you know, a small quantity, a small ship. Now with the, their golf facility is uh, reasonably huge, not as big as uh, Richard's Bay, but it's big. But we are all looking forward to a second one which can enable the market to import product together as a uh, open tender system. That's what the government keeps talking about. And of course, uh, towards the, the infrastructure, the import is one side. We also have the infrastructure on the cylinders that must go to each person's homes. Thank you. Um, Montour, I wanted to ask you, um, because we did get a question that came in, and it's an anonymous question, asking um, on the investment announcement that was made by uh, your CEO, is it ring-fenced for LPG, or is Total looking at other energy sources that might be considered as part of the uh, clean cooking agenda? Uh, particularly uh, for this uh, amount, what he has been placed, it is absolutely uh, related to LPG and uh, mainly, uh, you know, for the clean cooking uh, through LPG. So not not uh, other other alternative fuels. The other alternative fuels are, are for other other uh, you know activities and that that is having some other other uh, planning or investments yeah and your uh, your ceo also mentioned a pay uh, pay as you go yes yeah, you I, I think you yeah. framed it in a different way is this a technology a technology that was pioneered in east africa is this a technology that total is looking at pay yeah. as you go systems for lpg uh, I mean, all of us, we know that the, the the affordability is a big question for LPG because the higher front cost and the refill cost uh, uh, is a question. So when you talk about the clean cooking, 
we, we are looking at different uh, you know opportunities where we can minimize the the cost uh, for 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 these um, people so that they do not have to pay for the full bottle uh, you know they can just pay whatever they consume so we are uh, in in partnership with some of these um, you know inventors in in mainly in east africa and also we are looking for opportunities in other places so that uh, we can adopt this technology and can offer uh, to our consumers so that uh, it, the, the affordability uh, is become very much viable for them for clean cooking. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. Uh, all right, let's turn our question to the gender issue. And Pam, I'm gonna ask you because uh, as the chair of Women in LPG, um, you had mentioned earlier uh, this idea of having subsidies go directly to uh, women um, and the benefits that uh, LPG provides to women and girls. This came up repeatedly on the, in the summit uh, in IEA. Can you maybe tell us a little bit about women in LPG and uh, some of the programs or some of the initiatives that, uh, that have been launched to try and increase access or uh, increase the number of women that are in our industry? Yeah, thank thank you, uh, Michael. You you know this is a subject I'm extremely passionate about. Uh, so before I go to the actual network itself, and and bringing it back to the webinar topic, to add to that is how do we encourage uh, more female entrepreneurs and bring them into this industry? Um, and some of the things that's happening at industry level that I want to share. Uh, that we could very quickly adapt within our organizations is um, helping coach and develop businesses through enterprise development projects. And what, what does this mean is taking on the burden of asset management and financing and helping those showing potential of this market, uh, willing to roll up their sleeves and put in the work but also need some business guidance. So what, what does that look like is um, encouraging the switch to LPG while still retaining the accountability to maintain and comply with the highly regulatory environment. So this is ensuring that that potential female entrepreneur has the license to operate, but you're standing right beside her as the expertise in this industry. So that's another point I wanted to raise. Other initiatives include looking at a local champion who's already on their way that received this sort of coaching and mentorship to train other females, you know, uh, like develop or identify champions that have learned from these programs. Uh, peer learning, facilitate, encourage peer-to-peer -peer sessions, uh, we have adopted LPG to share their stories and, and the benefits. Um, but just to come back to, to Michael's question around the actual network. Now, everything I just mentioned is right there under the WLGA, and it's the WIN LPG, and that's women in LPG. So all these things and these topics and this coaching and this, this mentorship that is, that is offered, um, is supported through multiple factors. And this is where I want to encourage you to join uh, the, the network. This is actually championed by two, call it passionate, phenomenal women. And, and I, I just love sharing their stories because Nikki and Allison are so passionate about Win LPG that they're running along in terms of developing and launching chapters across the globe. So go and find out more. Get onto the website, join the website, and tap into all these initiatives and these coaching programs and find your mentor to take you to the next step. Um, the very last point that I want to make is there is um, a, you heard Michael spoke about it, it's coming to South Africa, LPG Week will be in uh, Cape Town in November. And I encourage you to join this. It's the first time the Win LPG is getting main center stage. So we're excited about this. Look out for this panel and, and try and find out more in terms of what you can do to become part of this network. Take advantage of it. Back to you, to our moderator, Michael. 
RPG uh, network. And if you have questions, please uh, let us know. Another reason for you to join the World Liquid Gas Association. James and Monzor, we have a provocative question that's come in. So um, let me know if you want to answer this. But uh, we are asked that the, we are told that the key to growing LPG in Africa is to turn the pledges made in Africa into tangible investments. Can either of you or both of you talk about specific investments that your companies are planning to make on the continent in the next uh, 12 to 24 months? Are either of you at liberty to, to talk about specific investments that uh, your company is going to make on the African market in the next couple of years? James, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, it's not something I want to be very specific about today, but I don't think anyone that uh, that knows what we do would would be surprised at what we intend to do next. Um, Christoph included, who, um, who kindly asked the question. Um, it's very obvious what we've invested in and what we believe in, which is medium to large scale infrastructure and logistics. Um, what we haven't done uh, to this point in, in continental Africa is invested in the last mile. And that's principally because we've seen the ability to grow markets fast is, is by giving our customers uh, and client base confidence that we're not competing with them. Um, and that's that's been an important part of the strategy, really. So I think the message is, yes, there is uh, further uh, considerable investment coming um, and more of what we've already done, um, but not quite ready to talk about it today, Michael. Okay, fair enough. Thank you, James. Bonjour. Yeah. You. Thanks, thanks, Michael. Uh, Total Energy is, is already present in many of these African countries. So we have the running activities. So the pledge or the commitments, whatever we have made, it's to uh, augment the existing facilities. And uh, we know that uh, the most important part for uh, uh, to, to achieve clean cooking is the cylinder. So there will be a significant investment in the cylinder as well as the associated infrastructure so that we can achieve the numbers what uh, Mr. Patrick Bune has, has committed definitely. Yeah, that's what I, I, I can say now. Okay, so cylinders and infrastructure, going back to this theme of infrastructure. Right, panelists, keeping my eye on the time, uh, I'm going to ask you to each give a wrap up statement, a final statement. So to the people who are watching this a webinar, what is the one or two things that you want them to leave today um, with on their mind about this discussion and about the future of LPG in Africa. And Elizabeth, why don't we start with you? Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to start or to add by says, uh, saying what I said at the beginning, that Kenya has made some very good uh, progress in the last uh, decade or so. Uh, government policies, private sector in, uh, investments, and uh, consumer also awareness uh, taking up LPG. Uh, we have also made some mistakes along the way, and uh, these mistakes to have to do have led to illegal peeling, lack of investment in uh, cylinders, uh, people, companies divesting like Corex divested from Kenya. And uh, for us to grow this market, we need to learn lessons from countries such as India and Morocco and um, any other sub-Saharan Africa country that wants to increase adoption of LPG, I would ask them to learn the lessons that Kenya has learned, do the right things that we did right, and avoid the mistakes that we did, and uh, indeed uh, grow the LPG business because this is the right time and we need to do it for our people in Africa. Thank you. Uh, Elizabeth, before you cut off your mic, what is the one single biggest error? I won't say mistake, but the, the one error that you would like other markets that, that Kenya made that you think other markets should try to avoid? The single error that we made is to allow the exchange of cylinders, which became a, a culture such that even when the, the regulations were removed, it has still remained uh, somehow happening uh, in some gray area. Uh, with, uh, some marketers are saying they have agreed, the law saying, no, it is not legal but the consumers don't know. 
So that is the biggest mistake I think we made. Thank you. Okay, so cylinders, getting the policy right, very important. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Elizabeth. Uh, final statement to you, Pam. What what would you like people to go away with this thing? But before you answer that, let me ask you this. You, you mentioned at the top of this discussion that uh, South Africa has an election tomorrow. Um, is there likely to be a change in policy towards LPG, uh, depending on what happens in the election? Yeah, it's it's um, for the first time, we actually don't know where the polls are going to go. We do not want to see a reshuffle considering so much work that has already been done uh, with the Department of Energy. So hoping that the reshuffling doesn't filter down to the Department of Energy. But most certainly, there's a lot of discussions going on around the um, cylinder exchange program, as Elizabeth just mentioned, informed by the deposit mechanism, the freight, and so on. So it's still work in progress, and we expect to see some good outcomes. And therefore, we would need to hear more from James on what he didn't want to see, Shay. So we'll take <laughs> you up on that. Uh, but yeah, just to answer your question and some final uh, closing statements from us, and I know you you did request around what infrastructure development looks like and future investment and and all of these projects that are going on specifically. I totally agree with Mansoor when he spoke to uh, enforce regulation. We need to see that happen. Uh, strict uh, law enforcement and support of government stakeholders. So that's the top three here for South Africa. But just to add, it is it is very welcoming to see the significant investment and pipeline that's happening within the LPG industry of South Africa. And specifically as the managing director of Oryx Gas South Africa, as a group, I'm, I'm extremely proud as there's significantly uh, a good pipeline of uh, um, cylinders specifically, uh, group includes um, managing over 11 million cylinders as a proof, as a pool of cylinders uh, to the clean cooking agenda. But more than that, investing in LPG import terminals, depots, refilling plants, there's evidence across Africa that all of this is happening. I'm specifically intrigued by what's going on in the clean cooking programs in Tanzania, where they aim to help 80% of population. Um, and further to that, in Senegal, uh, there's quite a material project on an import facility. So really looking at you know expanding to local population, but bringing it back home, there's a lot of projects that's going on in terms of a pipeline of investments. So very pleased about that. Last three points. Don't forget LPG oh, Day. Very quickly, very quickly. Yes, don't forget LPG don't Day. Forget LPG Day. Uh, it's It gives us a platform in terms of what we're doing, what we're sharing, and how do we echo that um, and cross learning. So LPG Day, Women in LPG, and see you all in Cape Town. Back to you, Michael. <laughs> Uh, see you all in Cape Town, indeed. Monzur, one minute. What's your final statement? What do you th what do you want people to remember? In brief, all of the stakeholders should work so that the benefits, the popularities of the LPG is not jeopardized. Safety, awareness, safety. That's it. Yeah, safety, awareness, safety. And you know, Monzur, we didn't speak enough about safety. In the next webinar, we're going to focus on that because it is such a key issue for the African continent and for anywhere where you have LPG. James, one minute to bring us home, buddy. What is your last, Okay. Uh, what do you want people to think about? Well, we, we, we've never claimed that LPG is the complete solution. It is, it's an important part of the energy basket, but it's, it's clearer today than ever that it has all the attributes to be a viable energy option for these growth economies that, that, as part of its success there brings about social improvement. And in that you're resolving things like clean cooking in the process. So I think it's more relevant than ever. I think it works through the energy transition um, and it depends on your, your evolution as a, as a country and as an economy as to how you view that, trans, that energy transition. But it's very clear to us that, that LPG transcends it. It's not just a means to an end. It goes way beyond that. that. That's it. LPG transcends it. It's not just a means to an end. It goes way beyond that. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, Pam, 
uh, Monzur and James. If the audience was in front of me, I'd tell them to give you a big round of applause. Uh, thank you so much. And with that, I will hand over to Bruno uh, and he's going to say some final uh, statements. And again, we're going to see a video promoting uh, LPG Week in Cape Town, where we hope to see you all in November. Bruno, back to you. Thank you, Michael. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions today. A recording of this webinar will be sent to all attendees after the session. If we didn't get to your question, please feel free to reach out to us directly at the contact that you can find on the association's website, worldliquidgas.org, or connect with us on our social networks, LinkedIn, X, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you to all sponsors, and again, to our amazing speakers, Pam, Elizabeth, Monzur, James, and Michael, for the fantastic Elucidity presentation, and to all of you for joining us today. We hope you found the webinar valuable and informative, and that we were able to let you know more on the development of LPG as a solution for clean cooking, knowing that it can improve people's health and have a positive impact on the environment. Please keep an eye out for follow-up email with the recording of the session. Have an amazing day, everyone, and see you in Cape Town.